Hi everyone, today on Out of Darts I'm going to finally get this Nemesis tutorial done. I am terribly sorry to those who have been waiting for this. I actually shot this video something like six or seven months ago and I was extremely sleep deprived at the time and what happened is basically the audio didn't roll for the entire video shoot and about half the video was missing and there was just no way to pick up a tutorial halfway through. So I am completely reshooting it. I am now on my rock solid bench. There will be no wobbly screen. I'm testing out a slightly different lighting setup. I don't like it quite as much as before, but I think this is going to be a good setup. At least the camera won't look like it's shaking because of the table. So this is the Rival Nemesis, extremely popular blaster, shoots rival balls. Today I'm gonna to walk you through upgrading it to a 3S LiPo. First, I'm gonna run you through the supplies. I will put the wiring diagram for those that are just looking for that. It's up on the screen, hopefully right now. This is a very basic wiring setup, but it, uh, it also includes motor braking to allow for a really snappy trigger response and a spool down for uh, stopping the trigger. So when you release the trigger, it'll stop really quickly firing. This blaster is capable of about eight balls a second when it's modded to 3S. You do want to watch for jams and be careful because right now there are currently no flywheels or easily accessible upgrade motors available. I do sell some 380 motors which are a little bit too long and require a spacer, but I'm hoping there will be more options down the road. Now, I don't want to take any shortcuts on this, so the only parts that I will fast forward will be things like uh, going through the wiring and then I'll walk you back through everything. I'm going to try a slightly different format to keep these videos a little shorter. When I first shot the very first video, I was confident that nobody had modded as many of these as I had because at the time I had done about 30, but now I'm quite confident that uh, both my buddy John, who mods for the shop, and uh, Josh over at Schmitty's Modworks, uh, both of them have done way more of these than I have at this point. But having done at least 30 of these, I do feel very confident in showing you how I would mod one. So starting off on everything that you need, uh, with components, we are going to work with my two switch plates, which are for the rev and fire circuits. We are going to use two 21 amp switches, heat shrink, wire, and XT60 connector. Uh, helping hands are very necessary. We're going to need solder, potentially flux if you need to clean your iron, and a soldering iron. It's nice to have a hot glue gun, as well as some water to dampen your sponge. Hot glue gun can be used to glue the switches in place if you don't have super glue, but if you do have super glue, I would definitely recommend that. This is some Instacure that I sell that is, it cures really, really fast, five to 15 seconds. It means no waiting for the impatient people like me. Uh, if you do not want to use my switch plates, which I highly recommend because it makes installing these dead simple. I've sold literally hundreds of both of them and had lots of happy customers, uh, but you can use epoxy putty. It will cost you nearly as much as the switch plates because there's a lot of buildup to do in there but it is a great option. Uh, you're gonna need a good screwdriver. This blaster has some very stubborn screws, so if you have a diamond-tipped screwdriver uh, or a simulated diamond tip, like artificial diamond tip, that can help. This one is not, but I, so I'm gonna show you trying to do it carefully with this and we'll see what happens. You're gonna need a 3S LiPo. I recommend this Zippy Compact 2260C. It's got way more current than necessary for this and it will last a whole day of gameplay. You are also going to need a cutting tool which could either be a drill or a Dremel. You could probably get away with just snips as far as the body modifications to get the switch seated. Uh, I really like using a Dremel because it's super fast for a lot of things. This is a fluted bit, which is really awesome because it just cuts like butter and it clears, it's uh, like the opposite of a drill. So it clears the hole as you go. And we'll use that so you can kind of see that in action. But that is literally, I believe it's called a fluted bit. It's um, reverse from what a drill bit would be. Really cool thing. You're also absolutely going to need a uh, lipo alarm and a charger. And then of course, a normal grinding bit would be great for the Dremel. That's everything you're gonna need. We're going to dive right in here and I'm hoping that this new setup will work really, really well. I'm excited to finally show you this. For those that aren't going to watch the whole tutorial, I would love to hear what blaster should I do a full mod guide like this in the future? What's the next one you wanna see? Now, I don't think I wanna do the Strife because I've already done that for my book and I'm a little bit tired of doing it. Uh, I got a little burnt out after that book, to be honest, because it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours to get the thing done. Uh, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. So let me know in the comments what blaster you'd like to see modded next, because I think I will take whatever has the most votes. 
let's get right down to it. All right, so first you're going to want to remove all of the screws. I have three screws marked here that are especially troublesome, and I just wanted to warn you about that before you start. Take extreme caution when using these, or you will need to drill them out, cut them, use a bolt cutter, that sort of thing. Uh, in the 30 I've modded, I've had at least a couple of these screws ruined in a, probably about five out of the 30, and that's really unfortunate. But they're very long, and they're either solvent welded or just have too much surface contact. Uh, they can be a real pain, so take some extra care there. Uh, but we can remove the hopper, the battery door, and we will get rid of the stock battery compartment. Set all of that aside, and then we'll get rid of all, take all of our screws out. All right, I've taken all the screws but the three troublesome ones, so I'm going to be very careful, applying nice, sharp pressure and going very, very slowly. If you don't be care, if you're not careful here, you're going to regret it. And I can already feel this one is very, very tight, but I am moving it slowly, carefully, nice, solid pressure down. Do make sure you are using the right size screwdriver. This is a uh, Phillips one. And you, if you don't use the right size, you are almost certain to strip the screw and be very, very unhappy. All right, so I have successfully removed all of the screws except for this front one. This is typically the most stubborn, and I hate to say it, but even with my very cautious, cautious, cautious use of this regular, the correct screwdriver, it has locked itself in place. Now... Now you have two options here. You can, if you have the shell, shell spread out enough that you can get in here and just simply snip that, that's totally acceptable. And honestly, even with that screw missing, because there are three screws right here, here, and here, and also up here, you're not gonna have any problem with missing that front screw. Uh, it's not totally ideal, so what I am going to try to do is this is a th reverse threaded uh, screw extractor. And what this does is it works just like a screwdriver, uh, a drill, but in the direction of removing this. So this will actually dig in and, in theory, take this out. So I need to run this, I have to remind myself, in backwards direction, counterclockwise that is, and we'll see if this can pull this out. All right, so I hate to say it, but I have done what some of you will likely do in modding this blaster and uh, I think the best solution is to have a diamond tip screwdriver, but really there's just not a lot of options. And I promise you, I was careful with that screw. This is, this is a possibility, so it is something to be aware of. Now I have some snips here. You could also use a bolt cutter. I am going to do the method of simply snapping this off, and I'm going to try snap it as high as possible so I can get a vice grips on to pull that off later. Now I recommend leaving all of your screws in your shell. You do not need to access anything else. Sometimes you'll get one that's a little stubborn, unless I missed one. Let's see if these two parts you can take and set aside. I recommend leaving these screws inside of them. And now we've got the shell off. So carefully set this aside, leave all the screws in, in, in it. Uh, in my case, I am going to uh, remove this guy here, and then I will come back later and hopefully remove the front screw and replace it. All right, now that we've got this open, you can set this uh, back side of your safety aside. We are going to do demolition, and the first thing you're going to want to do is uh, unscrew this screw here and this screw here. And this is to gain access to our entire firing assembly here, which is both the pusher and the flywheels. You'll want to watch that these little rubber gaskets don't get removed. If you lose them, it's not a huge deal, but they do, they are here for a purpose. They dampen the noise. And so those two screws will let you get this whole assembly out. Um, I do recommend setting those somewhere where you'll see them and won't lose them. I'm just going to leave them kind of close by, and I'm sure in the video they'll disappear. You can set the muzzle aside. We won't need that for a little bit. Next, we're gonna take our switch plate cover off. And I will bump the camera closer here so we can see more once we get get going. 
Now we can take our snips and pliers, and we're simply going to rip out all of the stock wiring. You do not need to care. You you can unscrew that part that I did there, but I just I just rip. There's um, it has no purpose for us anymore. This tape doesn't need to be in here. This is one guy you don't want to lose. We do need this up here. So you can either try leave it in there the whole time or set it aside. Um, it is required for our uh, for our putting the uh, battery door back on. So after we've got that out, we can snip away all of this wiring and fire up our soldering iron. This little cover, if it does pop off, by the way, is here. It's really interesting because Hasbro put a screw hole there, but there's no screw in it. So I have frequently uh, made the decision because they, it seems like a constant uh, easy piece to lose. I just take a, a Nerf screw, if I've got one the right length, that is. If you have a short standard Nerf screw around approximately eight millimeters in length, you can actually add a screw where it looks like an engineer intended there to be a screw, but there is not. So I, um, that will never fall off again. This can all be tossed away as we won't be using any of that. So continuing our demolition, we're going to snip all of these capacitors off. You could leave the capacitors if you want and solder them back to your motor tab there to uh, limit uh, RF noise, which can be bad if you've got electronics, like if you were gonna put a smart blaster in, the, in make, the, make a smart blaster out of this. Um, now when I'm working here, I liked to make sure I'm using safety glasses anytime I start snipping things that could pop out at me. And one of the easiest ways to get at these, to desolder these terminals is to snip the top of them off. Now the reason you do this is that they're usually coated in some plastic gunk. And I'm serious about the face, face protection. I just had one jump up at me. But if you snip these off, it's a lot easier to, to remove. And same thing here. You can see here there's tons of, a lot more gunk on this one because they're, they're coated in plastic. And so if you snip half of them off, they will desolder like a breeze. So fire up your soldering iron. All right, while the soldering iron is heating up, we're going to do a quick modification on the reverse side of this grip to make it compatible and make room for the switch. Uh, I have taped up all of my screws. That makes them stay in place. There are about six different sizes, so mixing them up is kind of a pain. You could also take them out and um, hide them in something. So on this side of the shell, we're going to snip these fins right here and they get in the way of the wiring later. So I like to just remove them. The screws here offer plenty of strength. So you're basically going to do just like this. And you can use your Dremel too here, but I, anytime I can use a snips, I do because it makes far, far less mess than, uh, than using uh, anything else. And I often take this one off too just to make sure there's no problems closing the shell. And then this guy right here. Now again, removing those two is not required, but the one that we're really gonna be worried about is this whole set of webbing here. Now you don't wanna remove it completely. We're just going to hack it down enough so that our switch lever can work. And if you wait to the end to do this, that's fine too. You'll see that when you close your blaster up, the trigger will stick. And I've seen a couple other tutorials out there and it seemed like some of them might have missed this. And um, and this is with my switch plate specifically. So you're looking at about like that. And this way the screw terminal will still work, but you'll have enough room for that to, to function properly. So that should be good on that side and we can set this aside. All right, while our iron is still coming up, um, depending on how long yours takes, we're going to continue this making flat. Now the way my switch plates work is that they are pre-positioned to get you, to get your switches in exactly the right spot. And if you kind of lock this in place, you'll see this is just going to be glued with a tiny bit of super glue on the bottom and then glued in place there as well. You could also use hot glue if you like, but you can see where this has got to move. So that part's has to come out. Now I like to leave this peg here if possible. That's this one here. I, so don't cut the one I'm touching. But you need to either Dremel or snip down until this is flush. So this here, that little area there needs to be cut out. Now I think for, I've got this in my hand, so I think I might go ahead and just snip this rather than 
than um, dremeling. We'll see how see how well it goes. You can often just keep making angled cuts. That might have been a bit more than I needed to take there. Now, of course, you do not need to use my switch plates. They're just a convenience thing. I modded enough of these that I got so tired of filling this void here or up here or back in here with with uh, epoxy. It just made sense to make something to make my life easier. This is a cool little flush cutter versus a snip. It's really nice for grabbing things like this. Now, again, you can also dremel this. This is, um, that's totally fine as well. It would more than do the job. One of my favorite things to keep around now too is an air compressor. I bought a cheap, cheap, cheap little $40 one at Harbor Freight and it does everything I need to do really well. So we're gonna drop this switch in here. It's like, can I remember how my own switch plate works? <laughs> and that'll snap in there. And this is so tight that you almost don't have to glue it, but I really would recommend at least hitting it with hot glue. And that looks like that is good now. And then we can grab our rev switch. I love the rev switch on this blaster, by the way. I think it's just super comfortable. And then there's a little extension and you'll see that there's a pattern that only goes, there's only one way that this fits properly. So it should be pretty obvious. You just kind of go around and do, 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 do. there it is. And what that does is just extends this far enough where we've got a perfect fit. And again, we're just going to glue this with a little bit of super glue. So I'm going to the method I'm going to do here today, too, by the way, is we are going to um, we're going to glue everything in place and then we're going to solder because I prefer to. All right, so I had a virtual <laughs> pausing here in the middle. I had a virtual repeat of what happened when I was uh, sleep deprived. Uh, as a professional cinematographer for 12 or 13 years, I'm used to professional tools, and this Sony camera I have only records 30 minutes and then shuts off with no warning and no. I've got a display over here and it never tells me. So. Basically, this only fits on one way. Put a tiny bit of glue on to hold it, and then you should be able to put it in here. You wanna make sure the tip of this is smooth. If it's not, you know, give it a little, a little trim. That feels great, no resistance. This you're gonna line, line up just past this little notch here, and you're going to glue it in place. And that goes here. Simultaneously, you've got the main switch plate here, the firing switch plate. This is the one that saves the most room. Uh, I like to glue everything in place and then solder there because it automatically holds the switches for me. And so generally this will, uh, this will allow us to uh, work a lot easier. But the idea is that this activates this switch. And if you do this correctly, if the spacing is right, uh, and you can play with this, this is up to your, your preference. But the way I like it is that it activates this switch mechanically and then that one. So you should hear click, click, just like that. And so that is uh, good to go. So a little glue there, glue in between there, and uh, glue underneath the switch. And you can use hot glue or super glue. I'm going to re-glue just a tiny bit more there on the edges. Uh, again, you don't want to go too crazy around the actual switch surface, just enough to, to damp the, dampen that surface. Otherwise, you could get some going up into the switch and causing a failure. Uh, after that, we are going to make a little room for wires. So we are going to be routing two 16 gauge wires up and through here. And so you can see those areas are a little tight. So I generally like to snip this whole thing off. And my apologies, we could have, this should have been in the demolition section of the uh, video at the beginning, but you'll live. Probably a good idea to put this, uh, switch, switch uh, screw back in to hold it in place. So we're just keeping in mind that we've got to get 16 gauge wiring in here. Now, the way I've designed this is that I intend for you to put the battery uh, in right here, because this is your battery compartment, and there is a channel right under here that allow you to slide a wire in and it will hold it. So this little notch here will hold the wires in that perfect little channel, which I'll show you when we get to that section. Uh, so over here, I'm going to snip a little bit more of this. Again, if you're snipping, please wear eye protection. I'm gonna try to keep this top uh, 
nub there because we are going to put this plate back on here eventually. And that's one of the features of this switch that I really like is that uh, if you do it correctly, you can put that back on. But, so I'm gonna clip this here. And again, that's just enough to get, uh, make sure you can get wire through and there's a little bit here. Now you again can Dremel this, but um, for the purposes of this, just doing it quickly, sometimes I just, this is kind of the way I do it because it's just, seems just as fast to me, I guess, but everybody has their own personal preference. Now one part where we really are gonna want the Dremel, and again, make sure you're wearing your eye protection, is to punch a hole here. Now, if you wanna use a drill, that's just fine. If you wanna use a piece of hot something, that's fine. If you wanna snip a notch out of here, that would also be fine. I like this flute bit because it doesn't pull in, but you do have to watch it uh, in, in the lateral direction. So, here we go. And that let me make a nice easy hole there for the wiring to come in. Again, I just blew it out with a little bit of um, power. So our wires will come in through there. And uh, now we're gonna go back to this plate. We're gonna get this back on board here. And there is this piece right here you're going to need to clip. And you can basically figure this out on your own just by looking at you know, what's, what's binding. And so I believe it's this, this guy here. It has actually been a little while. And then it is this lip here. And you just wanna keep checking, make sure that you've uh, clipped all of, that it's, that it's working, you know, before you screw it back down. But it should be very, very obvious. Always good to double check again when you close up the blaster, but the idea is that you still can have this plate here, and we're all good to go. And then we'll put our and then we'll put our screw back in. This is not the one that came from this hole. I have lost it. So again, you want to check. You've got click, click, and click, click, and they're just perfect. That one's going slightly before that one when I pull the trigger. So we're good to go. Now that you've got, we want to jump back over to our soldering iron. And this is a time when you are going to want to, uh, we're going to first remove the boards. So you're going to want a pliers here. And I like to tin my, tin my iron. Got a wet sponge here. Everybody's kind of got their own personal preference, whether they like more scraping or more sponging. But uh, use a bit of solder. You know, I'll do these top ones first. But the idea is a bit of solder on your tip. Touch it to that tip that you exposed. I like to use a pliers. You can use your fingers if you're careful. We're just going to fold that up. Now that I can grab a hold of that, we'll do the other side. Just standard desoldering. Come to me. There we go. And repeat for the other side. And then we're going to repeat the same thing for focus this motor this right here a little harder to see on camera but just desoldering it's the main it's the largest contacts with solder on the board some days i really wish i had like four or five hands not some days pretty much every day <laughs> It feels so great to be modding again. I, with all the lack of sleep, my lovely little daughter has now started to sleep more at 10 months old, and it has just changed my uh, total outlook on everything. Oh, hey, there's that screw that was supposed to go on the blaster. Oh, well. All right, so here we are now ready to start doing our actual soldering for wiring the blaster up. So you're gonna wanna have your wire handy. I have two colors, three colors here, excuse me. We're going to use this for the motor braking circuit, but color does not matter. I, I'm just doing this to indicate to you and match the diagram that I gave you, that I uh, put up in the beginning of the video. All right, so to start our wiring, 
I like to break the wire as little as possible. I almost always use 16 gauge wire, silicon wire with a fine strand like I sell on my site. Uh, this is really easy and very flexible, fits in all the areas you need to use it in and just very easy to work with. So I also like to break the wire as few times as possible. So what my method is soldering to here and then we'll solder here. And we'll do the same thing with the red, which will go this direction. Now with the red, I actually like to send it up the other direction. This isn't a requirement, but uh, you'll see as I get this in, it gets easier and easier. So I like to just mark where that flywheel is, and then you've got your points. And you do want to leave a little bit of slack in between here, because if you don't, you can have them being tugged on a little more than you might like. Now with the holes that are on these rival motors, there's enough room to actually insert your wire, even the 16 gauge, uh, as a through hole solder. And uh, anytime you can have a physical connection, I mentioned this in the book uh, as well, anytime you can have a physical lock on, on any component, it's always going to be a bit superior uh, joint. And so I will not tin that first one and uh, spend a little extra time with the soldering iron. And on that second connection, you can either just line it up next to it and add some solder, or if you like, you could also physically straddle the, the connection there. And that will allow you to uh, really have an extra solid connection. But either way, is if you have a good solder joint, you should have no problem with the strength of this. So, so same thing, we'll go ahead and solder that in. Now, I highly recommend getting a decent soldering iron, um, though I will say I am struggling with this tip. So something is going on with mine. I believe it's the inside here actually needs to be uh, sanded down, the ceramic uh, element, uh, because I think I'm having a problem with heat transfer. You can see I'm getting a pretty poor solder joint here. Now that we've got that part done, this first black wire is going to run back following our wire wiring diagram. It's going to come back here and it's going to connect to the, uh, uh, this is how it sits in the wiring diagram. So it's going to connect to this first point on the motor. So leave a little bit of slack here because this is going to sit inside this area here, but not, you know, tons of slack, just enough that it doesn't it can move around and be and be shaped. So I'm going to again, rather than break the wire and join it, I'm just going to very simply do that. And again, I tend to like, I'm not breaking any of the wire here, I'm just using it to hold itself in place. This actually saves you from even using helping hands more often than not. This doesn't work so much with regular uh, Elite blasters, it really only works with the rival, which have the larger motor terminals, um, and hold on a little better. All right, now that we've got that, we want to double check that our gaskets are back on here. Uh, if they are not, or if you've lost them, it's okay, but uh, they do help with vibration. And I tell you what, when this thing is modded on 3S, it uh, really rips. So it is going to be a lot louder and produce a lot more vibrations than it did in the stock configuration. So coming back to our blaster, we can now drop this back in along with the muzzle. There we go. And so now you'll see that this black wire is kind of on its way to where we want it to go next. And next, it's basically going to go all the way out and straight to our, our uh, battery. So that, is, that becomes our XT60 over there. So we've essentially already figure, finished our, um, our negative circuit for the entire blaster, so that's great. And now we will do the positive. So we take this, this positive here, 
that we had wired. Um, do take care that this wire runs over that pump there. And we're gonna take this all the way up and around and down and through and down to this switch and then all the way back up to the battery. So the way we're gonna do that is tuck it through here. In this case, I'm actually going to just thread it through because I seem to have it pretty tight there. So, but that's why I do have a kind of a specific order that I do this all in. All right, so we're gonna bring this down to the two terminals we are gonna use are the normally open. So these are open and then pulling the trigger closes them. So that's kind of our, our deal there. So it really doesn't matter which one you apply to. I like to run this wire down about like that as far as a path. And I like to leave a little bit of extra slack. And since this is going to a terminal, I'll give it some heat shrink as well. And if you kind of twist this wire, you generally can get it to just uh, poke through part of the switch and that will allow you to have a uh, part of a physical connection again like I mentioned in the book so now my soldering iron is behaving fine because I realized I had the temperature wrong I had turned it down because I was working on circuit boards and when you're working on a board you really don't want to pump too much heat into that board or you can fry the components on your board. Um, it was some Arduino stuff I was doing. So I've left enough slack so I can shove this heat shrink on there, hopefully. Oops. <laughs> so I've waited. I went too, too quickly. If you uh, do it just right, you can slide this down so that the residual heat will do most of the heat shrinking for you. The heat shrink is really not totally necessary, but I do think it's a really nice touch to do Kind of do things proper okay and we'll take our next piece that's left over on this wire and we'll do the same thing again we're going to i've been pretty good about getting myself into this habit this is a great modding habit anytime you strip a wire put a piece of heat shrink on it doesn't matter where because you can never have too much heat shrink i mean worst case scenario is you you lose a penny worth of heat shrink or i don't know five cents worth of heat shrink so i um I like to, uh, and again with these through holes, you don't even necessarily have to use this. You can generally get them to stick there pretty well. Yeah, close enough. So now we're going to take that wire back out and that is going to be go to our XT60. Now you could poke another hole in here, but I sort of like the clean installation of just having that one hole. So we're gonna thread this back through underneath our switch plate. Now you can decide to not glue that switch plate in earlier. That would be fine too. And then you would have easier access to it. But I tend to like to work with the switches just ready to go as much as possible. So that will go out to our main battery lead. So now as you can probably guess that if we made this an XT60, we would now have rev capability, but we have not finished up our pusher. So we know our rev should be basically ready to go. Uh, but now we need to do the pusher circuit. So I'm going to go ahead, now that I know that these are here, I don't need a ton of slack here, but you also don't want to have your connector like really wedged in here. And with a Nemesis, there is so much room inside this blaster that I'm generally not very concerned about the uh, space but so I'm gonna give it just kind of a decent pigtail we'll go with about there and then uh, continue on here so next we're going to be attaching to this switch here we're gonna get our positive lead over to our pusher motor now I have never replaced the pusher motors on here but I know there are people that are ha that have I get that question a lot um, so that's kind of up to you. The problem is, is it requires an adapter because there aren't, the right kind of motor doesn't quite exist um, off the shelf. But honestly, I don't think you're gonna see a huge improvement in just spinning the thing faster because I have shot these things on 4S and it was pretty uh, erratic. So I did not, um, 
<laughs> I guess I could have attached this before. In an ideal world, I would, I would attach this, this one before. I'd love to hear what you all think about this new format as far as my surface is a little different. Hopefully the camera is not shaky at all or uh, isn't perceived as shaky like it used to be with my old setup. I, I do hope I finally fix that. It's a little ridiculous as a filmmaker to have a shaky camera and I've got all this production, you know, gear and whatnot over here. So this wire here, we're gonna take over to this terminal right here which is the uh, common, and then we'll get power run to it next. So again, if you every time you cut, find your heat shrink, and it would be smart of me to keep these. I usually keep these in a drawer, pre-cut a whole bunch of them. And while I'm thinking about it, they should really be on here too. I keep stopping and getting very paranoid checking the camera because I do not want to lose the work One of the nice things about this blaster is there's just so much room uh, inside rival blasters. There's just, you don't really have to fight with uh, trying to fit wires generally. So I've gone with pre-tinning these, mainly due to the angle, make it a little easier. I will say that soldering on camera is always a little awkward because I normally hover right over this, but then my head gets in the shot and you can't see anything. I'm having trying to be careful here with my long reach, not to get a cold joint there. You can always test by giving a good little tug there and you'll uh, have an idea of whether... Another thing I'd really like to know from people if they're watching this is do you want to see every step of the wiring like you're seeing now or do you like the fast forward and just a wiring diagram? I'm, I'm literally, as I'm shooting this, <laughs> debating in my head how I should edit it because there's kind of two different main ways you could do it. So next we're going to go to our normally open and get that to the power. Now you could run this wire right by it and connect there or you could splice. I am going to go with uh, running it, running it uh, along, along it uh, in line rather than having to make two solder joints because what I'm doing here is I'm saving myself uh, a whole joint. So again, if that's not clear, you can simply take another piece of wire and connect it from here to this wire before on the way to the actual battery terminal, or what I'm opting to do here is break it in line and solder it in line. So the positive's coming in, it gives power to the switch, which gives power to here, then it comes down to here, and then back up. And so in this one build, I've kind of shown a few different ways to solder. One is to tin, tin the contacts and solder to a surface like normal. One is to straddle a joint, which I've done here, I also did that on the first first motor, and the other is to use a three through hole method when possible. Um, in an ideal world, everything we did would go through a hole, so these all of the switches would have nice big fat holes, um, but not all the ones available have them. And even though I buy these uh, Omrons uh, as direct from the manufacturer as you can, you always have to buy from a, a wholesaler, but um, they don't make them with the, the exact through hole that fits 16 gauge wiring in this style, so it's only other switches that have that. All right, and then finally, before we do our XT60, we've got one more thing, and that's to do our motor braking circuit. So now, if we plug these in, everything would work, but the motor itself on the pusher would run away. Uh, and what I mean by run away is that it would just uh, run longer than you want after you release it. So our last bit here is to 
connect this normally closed terminal on the firing circuit to the uh, negative right here. So we're going to piggyback that onto the same, same connection. And you can see this, of course, in the wiring diagram as well. Now again, these methods that I've shown you as far as soldering, you, there's no, I don't think there's necessarily a right and wrong. Anything with a physical connection is always stronger, but sometimes you'll find that due to space or due to the type of terminal, it might be easier or harder to do one type or the other. And I've never modded a nemesis that's failed due to my wiring. So I, and I've done all of the different methods uh, that I've shown in this video. Now you could do all the same or you could do mix and match. It's kind of up to you. And the more you, the more you do these, the, the more blasters you mod, the more you figure out and, and find kind of what's, what's best. Oh, and what did I forget to put on there? Luckily, I still have a moment. <laughs> so we'll slide a piece of heat shrink on there. Heat shrink is not totally necessary. I mean, really when it comes down to it for these blasters, it's nice, it adds a little, it adds a little strength, it adds a little bit of extra resistance on pulling and stuff, but generally it, you shouldn't be, nothing should be pulling on these once you're in. So I'm going to solder this directly to this terminal here. You also could choose to solder directly to this wire. You also could choose to solder directly to the anywhere along this wire, or you could run this wire through here like we did before. Uh, it really doesn't matter where you in the, are, the circuit completes, but for illustrative purposes, I think it it is a little easier to view and look at doing this way. So I'm going to uh, continue with it this way. And this one I'm certainly going to pre-tin because we're going to connect it to an already soldered joint, which we'll need to make sure pre-melts plenty to get us what we want. Now here we'll have no heat shrink because there's not really a way to do it. Now I wish I could uh, see... I am sure Josh from Schmidt's Mod Works will not watch this video because he is probably, um, he is definitely, I think he's be he's definitely beaten me. Um, and I only know that because he buys the switch plates in bulk for me. So he's, he's been uh, smoking me. And, and from what I can see on his Etsy, it, he does a great business too. So if I'm out of the blasters and you're looking for these finished, he has all sorts of blasters uh, up on Etsy that, uh, that are completed, modded, ready to go. And, um, I think that's always great because not everybody wants to mod and maybe can't get into it or doesn't have the time or just wants to compete with their office coworkers, etc. All right, and I'm happy with that. Got to remember not to get too anxious. Don't pull right away. Make sure it lets it uh, cools. All right, so now we, in theory, have finished everything but our XT60. Now, before I do the XT60, I'm going to go ahead and strip these. XT60 connectors, I, I went a little too short, so you want a little bit longer. These uh, auto stripping things are just a lifesaver, especially if you do. I mean, I've built something like 10 of these in one day, uh, and so anything that can save you just a little bit of time is totally worth it. What I want to do before I wire up the XT60 connector is just make sure that my polarity and everything looks good. Be careful when you're doing this. If you're doing this lipo, you could short out here if you're not careful. Uh, normally, I would use a nickel metal hydride pack, but it disappeared. So in theory, I have now given my blaster power. And we've got rev. I mean, we've got... Uh, I'm just checking the spin direction, and they... So those are great. All right. So we've got rev, we've got fire, and we've got the fire trigger activating the rev mechanically here. Now again, you could do this just like we do Jupiter. You could wire this in a different method so that it electronically does this, but I like the physical connection uh, in this case because it ra runs less load through this main switch because the most common thing to burn out in a mod like these is this switch, which is the, one of the reasons I recommend a genuine Omron only for the rev switch on these. Uh, these blasters on a really beefy 3S can actually hit 135. 
I borrowed uh, Zambonas at the uh, end war, not this year, but last year in 2017. And I wasn't even able to play with it. It was uh, kind of crazy. So uh, they can hit pretty hard as far as uh, FPS and whatnot. Uh, but I find that they generally end up around 125 to 130. I was using really heavy gauge wire and an insane graphene uh, 65C 2200 milliamp pack, so it was a very large, large pack. All right, so now that we've tested that, we're gonna wire up our XT60. And uh, one more thing I like to do here is I'm going to take an extra piece of heat shrink and I'm gonna shove this all the way down here. This is the larger heat shrink I sell. And I'm gonna shrink this and put it part way into that hole just as a little strain relief. Totally not necessary. Uh, just not not necessary, <laughs> but I like um, I like things looking clean. I like extra uh, protection whenever I can give it, or whenever it makes sense to do so. All right, so we're going. All right, so now we are going to wire up our XT60. I am going to um, pre-tin them both. I am still running on a little too much caffeine here, but. Not that I have the steadiest hand in the world to begin with or anything. I uh, don't think I could have been a surgeon. Sorry when that drops. <laughs> there are several ways to do an XT60 and I just did this not even the way I normally do. <laughs> I normally just tin them a little bit each, and then um, and then then work the flux into the whole thing. Oh, and I just made a mistake. This is something I would have been mad at myself if this was a customer blaster, but it's going to be mine. <laughs> I dropped some solder right here. One of the hazards of soldering over your blaster, and this is why painting stuff. After, you know, modding after painting is really a, a challenge. Is you can easily drop solder on a on a shell or something that you you want to keep, and that's no good. All right, and we'll do the second XT60. And you definitely need to be patient with these guys. I like this method. I'll do a video on this to explain someday too. Oh, sorry about that. Focus. I like this method of um, using a second one to keep the connector formed properly to help with heat dissipation and uh, just a convenient holder that you don't have to clip on um, that you know is going to work. They also make some other uh, harnesses and, and mounts, but I got one from Hobby King and then I ended up not using it because I just think that this works really well. Normally I would actually use the other wire, the jaws here to hold it, but because I've got it coming out of the blaster, there's plenty of retention there. So after that, while that cools, I'm going to shove these uh, small pieces of heat shrink on it. This is one step where heat shrink, I think, is extremely uh, necessary. Because you, uh, it's, that's an easy joint to potentially short. So now with this extra piece here, I'm going to sort of fold that and then slide it until I get it uh, in there. And I'm going to put it halfway straddling this hole. And I could probably have gotten a slightly better size. Lastly, I like to take a piece of this half inch heat shrink, it's the larger size I sell, and stretch it a little bit and then just plop it onto the XT60. And this just adds a little bit of extra strain relief and a nice clean kind of finished look. And uh, with that, we should be done and ready to close it up and test it. But always before you do that, <laughs> check it out. Uh, make sure it actually works. And I might, okay, we got rev, we got fire. And I would go so far as to shove some balls in there because if you don't, you'd be disappointed. Now. Uh, don't freak out, I've had people think that this is going backwards. This does rotate in this direction, um, meaning it actually bounces the balls kind of up. Whew, that's just on 2S and that hits hard. 
Before we put on our shell, we are going to want to return these two final screws. Now, the reason I wait till the end to do this is that if you have problems, you're going to have to rip it back out. And I've, I've definitely done silly things like wire it backwards. Uh, you know, just stuff happens and it's always nice to be able to get at it. So I like to wait till the end to do that part. After that, we're ready to place our shell. I want to just make sure that you've got these wires clear of that uh, that nub there. And um, these wires, I've got the way I've got these pictured, they cannot go there. They need to go down and around. And this is why it's good to leave slack like I have. After you've play got this back in place, you do want to replace this little bit here. And then you're going to close up the blaster and hopefully you should be ready to go fire your new modded blaster. I'm just watching my wire paths. This is where if you did want to hot glue them, you could. Definitely not a requirement on this blaster. I've done many, many, many of them without uh, needing to do any hot glue. This is also a good time to reinstall this safety lock trigger on the other side. After you've replaced your trigger, you can now close up the entire blaster. This is where you, where you will find out if you're, um, you've done everything correct with your trigger. If you find any sticking here, then you'll want to um, take a look inside there and see what could be sticking. Mine is looking good. Uh, this can change, of course, when you tighten up your blaster. But I will uh, go ahead and close mine up now. Remember to take special care with these two and the front screw. Hey, I'm good. So after you've got all of your screws, you're going to want to replace these two bits here. And this should line up with that, that little part inside. And that's what actually allows your uh, jam door to open. And I am hoping that I have that in the right spot. It's easier to put this side in first and then try to get the other side in. And when you've got it in correctly, it should pull this tab. So if it doesn't pull that tab, uh, you got something wrong. Now I did, of course, mention that the front bottom screw here is hacked in half. I'm just going to leave it because it is plenty tight. It is not going anywhere and uh, it's not ideal. Hopefully it doesn't happen to you. Like I said, it doesn't happen on every blaster I've done. Probably about a quarter of them if I had to take a guess on an average. And with that, we are ready to uh, put our blaster back together. This one's got a, one of our sling points on it ready to go. Kind of excited about that. And then we will plug it in. That is good to go. Uh, we will grab our, we will install our LiPo alarm to be safe. And then uh, after that, we'll go out for a test fire. One thing I would recommend is you can take some foam or something similar to just uh, pad this so that when you're running around, this isn't bang, bang, bang around. But for now, since I'm just gonna do a quick test fire outside, hopefully not in the rain. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you tuning in. I would love to hear what you have to say about this mod guide. I hope it really helped you. All of the parts and kits for this blaster are available on my site. And what would you like to see next? Until next time, thanks for watching. I'm out of darts.